uh, students, some of them uh, already uh, joined the class, some of them still. Uh, so can we wait uh, a little bit, maybe um, two minutes? Is that okay for you, Frank? Sure, yes. Okay, so um, this is gonna be the hybrid because the situation right now is that uh, some students, they can travel to Thailand and uh, join the class here. Uh, but uh, to be honest, just only few, uh, maybe just uh, kind of tens. And then we still have uh, the less who, uh, who cannot come <laughs> because of the pandemic. And, Actually, also Frank Fisher uh, as well. <laughs> Actually, he expect to be here today. Um, uh, at uh, this session, uh, you're gonna have a very good chance to learn from the author of the uh, essential books. I uh, just finished reading this one as well and feel really uh, in place, uh, learn a lot myself. Uh, even I uh, talk to Frank quite often, to be honest, but I'm not really uh, know that uh, in the time that I'm not have a chance to discuss with him, he has a very intellectual um, uh, engagement in a very interesting topic and very important topic. Uh, controversy uh, and also uh, the current uh, debate in our field of public policy. Uh, just uh, make a very uh, brief introduction about Frank Fisher. Uh, he is the um, professor uh, at the moment at the uh, Hamburg University in Berlin, uh, Germany. Uh, he uh, received the um, uh, award, uh, the uh, uh, Laswell and Wildowski uh, Awards uh, for his contribution to the topic of, uh, to, the, uh, to the field of public policy. So um, it's very, uh, I mean, not, not uh, anyone can have a very uh, uh, close uh, chance to learn from him, especially uh, from the books that just launched, I would say, uh, two weeks ago, right? Uh, two or three weeks ago, really recently, I would say. So um, I'm gonna give uh, the floor, uh, open the, uh, the <coughs> for you. Uh, you can spend uh, maybe 30 minutes uh, or maybe more or maybe less, uh, feel free to uh, spend your time. And then uh, our student and other participant gonna, uh, kind of uh, raise the question or point out any um, uh, uh, issue that they want to. Okay, Frank, um, you want me to share your presentation or you want to do that by yourself? Uh, good morning. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I wish I was there in person. Um, but the things are what they are. Um, you mean that when you say share the presentation, do you mean the PowerPoint slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want yeah, to do uh, yourself? Uh, yeah, you could have the first one now. Do you have it? You're getting yeah, yeah. it. So, yeah, I'm um, going to say a bit about um, <clears throat> the um, topic in my recent small book that came out in the um, Cambridge um, public policy series, what do they call it? Essential, um, whatever they call it, essential issues or something, topics. And um, it has a lot in it. So I'm only presenting a segment. Um, 
and maybe in the discussion, I can add more um, if the topic takes a turn in that direction. In any case, to begin, uh, it goes without saying that um, the critical topic, I should say a critical topic in political discussion today is the emergence of post-truth, fake news, and the implications of alternative facts for democratic governance. It's a problem for governance in general, but nowhere is it more important than in the politics of climate change and COVID policy. Uh, you could slide two, people. Um, although there's nothing new about misinformation, fake news and deception, in politics, the topic has taken on new importance, of course, since the election of Donald Trump and the Brexit, British Brexit vote to leave the European Union. Moving to the forefront as well then um, in the political discussions of other countries, including your own. Before uh, spreading to, uh, yeah, before spreading to other, okay, other countries around the world. So a full treatment of this topic is beyond the present scope of the discussion this morning. The focus in the book is thus in large part limited to several primary aspects of the debate, beginning with the contention that social constructivism in the social sciences, particularly postmodern social constructivism, has laid the groundwork for post truth politics, that it is responsible for what has happened. This is what led me into the topic. There was a, a, a slew of books that came out that make this claim, and it struck me as extremely unlikely that these right-wing um, troublemakers were sitting around reading postmodernism and saying, aha, we can use this to uh, make up anything we want to say. So I delved further into the topic, particularly as I um, share the constructivist perspective um, particularly of concern is the view that the problem from this perspective is one of epistemology. Um, the challenge of um, postmodern epistemology to standard ways of thinking about knowledge, when in fact I argue that it's not epistemology, it's actually politics. I argue here that social constructivism can actually help move us, help move our understanding of post truth beyond a narrow and often misleading focus on the role of facts in policy argumentation, particularly in the case of climate and COVID uh, policies. That is to say that not only is the constructivist perspective um, not guilty, it actually has something uh, important and positive to contribute to the understanding of um, the topic at hand. The objective is not to find a way to support climate or COVID denial. In what follows, I focus on climate denial 
because uh, add, focusing on both just takes too long here in a presentation, but we can come back to COVID. So I, I, I try to focus, try to understand the construction of denial arguments, how they get put together. In the view here, constructing an effective counter argument will also depend on understanding how they do it. I take up two points here. One is the argument that the deniers do not accept scientific evidence. In the climate case, the evidence of the IPCC. That is, the deniers simply reject these objective facts, objective quote, close quote, and are thus, key word, irrational. Basically because they don't um, follow the prescrip prescriptions of what when boiled down is basically the positivist understanding of knowledge. Beginning with constructivism, academics and journalists have portrayed it as creating a widespread degree of doubt about the nature of knowledge, knowledge and truth, that is, it is seen as facilitating, if not having given rise to post-truth politics. This argument I'm asserting is not only mistaken, it rests on a misleading understanding of social and political knowledge. When understood in less radical terms, a, a less radical postmodern perspective, constructivist constructivism not only helps us understand how, how knowledge is created, particularly knowledge in the social world, but how to get a better grip on the post-truth debate as well. Beyond this, I have to be uh, brief. Social constructivism does not point to any particular political conclusion, left or right. As used here, following Karl Mannheim and Berger and Luckman, it is a methodological perspective for helping, for helping us to understand what we think, that understand that what we think, even about facts, is never neutral. Rather, thought is embedded in deeper social meanings, constitutive of the world, meanings that make up the world as we understand it and live in it. This applies to science as well. Science as the product of a community of social inquirers is also in part socially constructed. One can argue about the degree to which social factors play a role, but they are definitely present. But this is not to say um, it has, that is science has no empirical validity. We just need to understand it differently. Rejecting the climate warming data, to take up the climate case, deniers say that IPP, IPCC um, numbers on warming are based only on a consensus of opinion and are not as such uh, a proven truth. That is, it's just a matter of opinion. 
albeit the opinion of scientists. To more formally make their case, they draw on standard methodological principles of positivism, without calling it that. Some even go so far as to lean on the work of the philosopher of science, Karl Popper, who put forward the thesis of falsification, which I guess leads to what we generally call um, neo-positivism. Uh, they argue that following Popper, the IPCC numbers cannot be falsified. Their critics say that this is up obfuscation, which it surely is, at least in part, but from the perspective of the sociology of knowledge, they are not wrong to say that the evidence is based on consensus. As a social reconstruction of our understanding of science <clears throat> shows, science at every, any given point in time <clears throat> involves a consensus among inquirers, a consensus forged by a, science, a community of scientists, which is a social group with a hierarchy, competing interests, and all of the human foibles that implies. This is not our normal way of thinking about scientists, but um, if you enter the academic world from any particular discipline, you will learn quickly that there is a hierarchy, that it is a social group, and that there are competing interests, um, particularly focusing around um, uh, theories, but also jobs. So it's not just the guy or woman who has the better theory. There is more involved. The deniers are thus correct to point to a consensus of opinion, but wrong to assume that this question can ultimately be proven by strict positivist methods. It can't be. From the constructivist studies of science, we see that there is never a final proof, despite, despite the fact that we are taught in school that science proves things to be true. Actually, scientists would agree that what they take to be truth at any one point of time is always open to change. And we see this over time, even if it's long periods of time, such as uh, from Newton to Einstein. But the deniers take this further. Their main argument is that the IPCC consensus is wrapped into a larger neoliberal governance strategy, a neoliberal global governance strategy advanced by particular political and economic elites. That is that the numbers are only reflect what these elites want us to do. They, and they hide the elites who have made these decisions. Many of them believe, they believe this to involve an elite conspiracy organized and supported by institutions such as the United Nations. In the United States, we even had groups who believe that the United States, the United Nations is trying to subversively overtake, uh, take over the United States. This, they see this as a deeply problematic conspiratorial threat to individual liberties and free markets, leading to even excuse for 
rigorous economic regulation, the planning of resources, and more authoritarian forms of government. And uh, you don't have to look too far in the literature on this topic to find out that if we took climate change seriously, if we confronted it at the level that it has to be uh, confronted to hold us down to 1.5 or 2.0 degrees, this would in fact involve serious regulations, the planning of resources, and in many cases, more authoritative um, methods, which I've written about in a book called Climate Crisis and the Democratic Prospect. Already we see that democracy is in serious trouble, challenged on all fronts, and climate change will only intensify this. So as these measures are not improbable, they feel justified, the deniers feel justified to challenge this politics of climate change at every turn. Sometimes, some of them, even violently. Their emotional outrage can indeed come across as irrational, but what they've actually identified politically rather than theoretically is what science study scholars have called a truth regime. The concept first proposed by Michel Foucault, but also developed by Sheila Jasanoff as part of her theory of um, co, part of her theory is co-production. According to this theory, scientific investigation and science policy do not stand alone. They're not separate things. Rather, they are part of a regime of truth constructed by a state that fuses knowledge with sets of goals, norms, and institutions. Now, if you believe in this particular state, you might not see this because you accept these goals, norms, and institutions as given. So you'd say, well, how could it, why would it, should it be otherwise? You only can discover this if you try to um, change it. Then uh, the resistance that you will encounter will make clear that something more fundamental is involved. In the words of Foucault, a regime of truth constitutes a general politics of truth, which specifies the kinds of discourses that are accepted and turned into carriers of what is taken to be truth. It includes the mechanisms that enable people to differentiate truth from false claims, the ways in which truth claims are legitimated and sanction the procedures and techniques given value in the quest of truth and the standing of those who are responsible for declaring what counts as truth. Uh, we can all sort of recognize these points, but mostly they are taken for granted and that's the point of a truth regime. It sort of fixes, reifies these understandings so that nobody questions them, but they are constructed through history for particular reasons. Um, if we had a larger, longer period of time, 
I could show you historically why positivism emerged. It didn't always exist. It emerged to deal with a particular set of social problems as um, Europe was collapsing before the Enlightenment. So without using this language per se, these are just the sorts of questions that deniers raise about what they seem to be an elite hegemonic conspiracy. That is, the questions that they throw back at us are questions about who gets to say what knowledge is. What are the procedures for this? Um, uh, I'm looking at the chart here. Um, the mechanisms that enable people to um, differentiate between truth and false claims. Um, these are all actually the issues that um, the post-truth deniers are raising. That is, they're raising deep fundamental uh, questions. And because they're based on a societal set of constructed understandings, um, they can be raised. It doesn't mean they're right, but in a certain sense, it also means that they're not, the questions they raise are not totally irrational, though they require answers. In this regard, client deniers believe that elites have attached their own narratives to the IPCC numbers. That is, that you have these numbers that they come up with, and then they attach, they, they put these numbers in a social narrative about society what the problem is, where we come from, where we're going, what the dangers and risks are and so forth. But the story is separate from the numbers. Here, like co-productionist theorists, they believe that the way these elites know and represent the world, both natural and societal worlds, is not separate, separate, is not separable from the way in which they choose to institutionalize that world. Basic to the social constructivist position, of course, is the fact that meanings are attached to numbers. They do not inherently carry their own narrative meanings. This is where social constructivist starts to be useful in that it already understands that meanings are attached to the numbers uh, that we uh, produce, the events that we create, the things that we do, and so forth. We attach narratives which are designed to explain those events. But there can be other narratives. Society holds together because over a long period of time, a large enough group of people come to believe a particular narrative, or I should say, and or the narrative is imposed from the top down by elites, political, military, uh, or whatever form. And just here, as a fellow named Allen shows in his analysis of climate debates, Different and shifting meanings have indeed over time been attached to the ICPP numbers. For example, the Cold War security narrative designed to motivate a global climate politics um, put forward, they would say, by the uh, elites of the countries that signed the Par Paris Accord. He shows that in the early days, the debates 
about climate change attach stories about risk to the numbers, but risk didn't work. It didn't rouse up people um, to march around and demand change for climate change. So other things were tried and a primary example was to say, okay, let's attach the Cold War security narrative uh, to the numbers. That is that we're at war, um, that we have to act as such. Uh, this is the new challenge uh, that humanity is, even humanity could be um, at stake. Just as was argued about um, the use of say atomic weapons. In other words, the story is used to interpret the importance of the numbers. But the story does not come from the numbers. The deniers correctly argue that other meanings can also be attached to the research findings. And this is what they seek to do. That is to offer a counter narrative to the dominant narratives offered to justify the need for global worldwide action on climate change. This counter narrative is not built on the numbers, but rather on the social and political consequences that follow from the numbers. That is, if you follow the numbers, take them seriously, certain social and political things will happen which they take to be unacceptable. What we discover then is that this is not about the numbers per se, um, although the numbers remain important and some deniers now even accept the numbers. It is instead about the modes of governance and the political ideologies that spell them out. This means, in short, and this is the key point, no amount of improved numbers or fact checking, which has become a kind of industry, no amount of these activities will bring this debate, debate to an end. That is, you can't get better climate numbers and show them and convince them to change their mind. It's not about that. We find good evidence of this in um, Melanie and uh, Naomi Klein's analysis of the sixth annual climate change conference at the Heartland Institute the leading organization of climate deniers. Klein cleverly went to the conference, sat in as a kind of anthropologist and followed their arguments, talked to them in the corridors and so forth. As she discovered, the scientific findings, despite the conventional criticisms of these deniers, namely that they don't accept the facts, were not actually the primary worry organizing the discussions at the conference. Climate change was seen to be less concerned about the state of the environment and more to do about, quote, shackling capitalism and transforming the American way of life in the interest of global wealth redistribution directed by unknown elites. I think I have a, yeah, a slide where the arguments, yeah, thank you. Um, Klein concluded with an interesting message for the political left. 
as she put it, when it comes to the real world consequences of those scientific findings, specifically the kind of deep changes required not just to our energy consumption, but to the underlying logic of our economic system, the crowd gathered at the conference hotel may not be or may be in considerably less denial than a lot of professional environmentalists. environmentalists. That is, from this perspective, you can see that the environmentalists miss the point. In any case, she says, the environmentalists who paint a picture of global warming, global, global warming Armageddon, and then try to assure us that we can avert the cat catastrophe by buying green products and creating clever, clever markets uh, to control pollution. What does this mean? What does this mean more specifically? To say that climate deniers focus on the social and political meanings of the evidence. What they recognize explicitly or implicitly is that empirical findings in the world of politics have to be translated into political knowledge. That is the numbers have to be translate, translated from techni the technical realm into the world of politics and political knowledge. More specifically, evidence has to be converted into knowledge that fits their political narrative, or at least can be interpreted by the narrative, a particular narrative. Although climate change is generally presented in terms of relatively straightforward numbers about the degrees of warming, Allen shows, shows how the numbers carry a political message when they enter the political debates. As he writes, climate change in the early years of the debate was defined as an issue of risk, but was later presented as a matter of national security. The data was implicitly translated into a form of knowledge, a form of political knowledge that sought to portray the numbers as implying a specific existential threat to humanity, um, which they may be. But the point here is it's not necessarily the only interpretation of these numbers. Scientists, Allen argues, adopted the grammar of security in a way to construct existential threats to life on the planet. That is, rather than just presenting the data, they sought to motivate political change by connecting the data to ideas about technology, the history of the earth, and humankind's place in it. It is in just this sense that the climate deniers are not entirely wrong when they argue that the appeal to climate science is part of a political strategy. They correctly recognize that the societal implications are big, but that the discussion of them, of these big implications, social and political, are never prioritized and fully considered openly and candidly in the public media, which presents the numbers 
against the background of the dominant truth regime, which otherwise we all take for granted. Indeed, many of us probably do. But we have to recognize that there's an ideological element to that. That is the need for a planned society, greater role for experts, and the restraint on individual freedoms, among other things. These are never really discussed. The point here is not that one side does this, that is this kind of translation of narratives, and the other side does not. Rather, it has to do with the nature of political knowledge and its social construction. In the throes of political struggle, to borrow from Alistair McIntyre, the story attached to the data becomes more important than the policy and its relevant data. That is, that it's actually the story that's driving the struggle. It's also important to note that the climate deniers do not necessarily reject formal science. They just say that it is important to get both the scientific evidence and political priorities right. Given that we can't prove things, you can, can, you can constantly argue that you have to get better data if it's self-serving. You say, well, I don't accept that yet. You have to um, fight, come up with more stuff. Uh, I'm not taking a COVID vaccine via, uh, we don't have enough experience with it. We don't know what the long-term effects are, which is not wrong. But does it meet the current situation? As Blast uh, put it to his Heartland Institute followers, Conservatives and libertarians should not just accept the IPCC findings as article of faith, given the massive increase, increase in government at the expense of freedom. In other words, we shouldn't just follow this road without looking at where it's taking us. He says, a little uh, hypocritically, Let's do our own research instead of accept the research of the scientists who take the money from the dominant elites who run the government because they have a special interest in a particular kinds of uh, outcomes. His institute, Heartland, takes this step, takes this a step further, calling for a restoration of the scientific method by which he means research that can be trusted, um, unbiased. And here, they are not without supportive arguments. They can even appeal to the sophisticated theories of knowledge, pointing to the scientific theory of falsification, as I already noted. They emphasize that science results need to be regularly subjected and to and to contestation and refute refutation. Well, that's true. Science would admit that their current findings will always be contested. So you can argue with a straight face that there needs to be more research because that's the way science works. Climate change critic Stuart Franks maintains that much of the public information about climate change cannot withstand the test of falsification. That's true. It's also true, we now know that there are some major flaws uh, with falsification, but that's another topic. It, it remains though the ideology of the scientific community, falsification. Although one could find the argument disingenuous, disingenuous given the very high levels of agreement 
based on the research of leading climate scientists, climate deniers employ for the most part a conventional understanding of the scientific method to good political effect, conservative effect. In fact, they adhere to a view that is close to the mainstream methodological theory or rhetoric of positivism. They, in fact, just turn positivism against itself. This only works because we largely accept the school book idea that science proves things in the story. Well, we don't look inside the black box of what science is about. It's the case in this regard that proof of the human contribution to climate warning, at least to the degree to which humankind contributes to it, has not been fully resolved. And it is therefore not altogether absurd to call for further research following accepted uh, methodological uh, principles. On the other hand, you could say there's a huge amount of evidence that supports this, so it seems like it's the best thing to do is to accept it. But you can't really say it's finally proven. So the deniers exploit this gap. Rather than proof per se, as they argue, the evidence is mainly an accumulation of judgments from a particular group of client scientists, it thus remains possible to argue that they have not proven their case. It is a challenge that can be easily employed by those who wish to oppose a policy based on particular evidence. It can be done with a straight face as it's not wrong. The issue is has not been proven, which can have a resonance with those who rely on the mainstream understanding of scientific investigation. They can do this, moreover, by citing well-established scientists who have uh, debated the issue, argued against it. It's just here that the role of social construction can offer an essential insight. According to the social constructivist theory of knowledge, that which is taken to be knowledge at any one point in time is a matter of scientific consensus, consensus among qualified members of the relative community. And this is what the community of climate scientists have offered, a consensus based on existing peer review research. In fact, the IPCC does not do the research. They just collect all of the existing re re research and develop a consensus of which research seems best. So the idea, the social constructivist idea um, that it's a consensus is fully uh, appropriate here. It's exactly what they would say they're doing themselves. A new wave of climate deniers have moved beyond the question of data to focus on the construction of climate arguments, in part because they've been losing the data battle. These deniers have come to more or less accept, at least privately, the high level of agreement about the human contribution of warming and have shifted to arguing that the problem is too big, too big to be able to do anything that would significantly mitigate or adapt to the consequences. That is, we don't know what to do. We could spend a lot of money uh, and accomplish nothing. Moreover, what might be done would have a drastic impact on the economy, global economy, domestic economy. For them, the risks are too great given the limited knowledge about climate change and how to deal with it. They say we don't know enough, so we can't take action. It would be stupid to take action. The country could pour a huge amount of money into the mitigation and adaption and still fail to bring the problem under control. Some of them have now chosen to politically smear climate change activists and scientists as biased rather than focus on the findings. When it comes to smearing, one of the most notable efforts including uh, involves, one of the no most notable efforts involves the hacking of email accounts of client researchers at East Anglia University in the UK. 
This was instructed. Some of these emails that were hacked, emails by leading res climate researchers, spoke to other fellow colleagues, climate researcher colleagues, of the need to organize and present the climate data in the strongest possible terms. That is, just don't present the numbers, organize them so that they look even stronger. Indeed, there was a suggestion of, quote, spinning the message just before the Copenhagen Environmental Su Summit, which came to be called Climate Gate. One scientist, for example, wrote an email stating that he cannot overstate the huge amount of political interest in the project as a message that government can give climate change to help them to tell their story. In other words, they need to help um, government tell the story. And worse, another discuss advisability of hiding and obscuring findings that they didn't, didn't fit the standard climate change scenario. This led climate skeptics and deniers to express outrage about the findings of biased scientists. I mean, in fact, this was extremely embarrassing. Scientists aren't supposed to be saying these sorts of things. That's not the way uh, science works. You're not supposed to hide the evidence that doesn't look so good. That lawyers do this in a courtroom, but not scientists who are just out to find the so-called truth. This, to be sure, proved to be more than a little awkward to the scientists involved, leading to investigations by the university. And as such, it was raw meat for the conservative social media. They had what they saw as proof that the scientists were biased, that they were supporting a particular political regime with their data. But what it actually did from the perspective I'm advancing here was to confirm the social constructivist understanding of scientific work. The scientific community was seen to be made up of a social group with all of the typical human foibles that is made up by individual scientists with opinions. This did not, as claimed, refute the data as such. It only illustrated the human dimension of an epistemic community, as well as illustrate the strategic nature of the argumentative process when science is employed for political decision-making. It is a kind of political translation process that Alan had described. The reality is both sides do it, but try to hide their conventional understandings when they do it. Thus, what we need is an authentic sociocultural discussion that is a discussion not just about the facts, but about the social and political context of the facts and their meanings. Whereas mainstream environmentalists focus on the data and argue that it is irrational not to accept these facts, the underlying issue is actually about their implication for our way of life, about the political theory of climate change. We do not know at present how to organize this debate politically on any kind of large scale, but recognizing that it's the discussion that we have to have is a first step. So that's this segment of uh, the book, and I thank you for your attention. lovely 30 minutes. 
and this is going to be very good opportunity for uh, everyone here, uh, especially online and also some someone online, to uh, raise the question or point out any point of discussion. Okay, uh, 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 could we start with John? Uh, you said that you have something to say, please. Uh, the question or any point of discussion. Or you can uh, speak from there, I think. Frank, can you hear me? Can, can you hear oh, me? No, not really. It's broken up. <laughs> uh, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Frank Fisher. Uh, my name is Noe uh, or John. Um, I'm from the Philippines and I'm a PhD student here at Chiang Mai University School of Public Policy. Uh, yeah, one thing that really struck me when I was reading your book is that you mentioned Philippines as part of the, uh, the spread of the misinformation and fake news as one of the <laughs> foundational argument in your discussion in, in, in the book. Um, well, um, maybe I, I would like to point out some critical points that I have, uh, I have uh, read from your uh, book, from parts of it, not totally all, but, and also uh, points from the discussion that, that you have presented today. Um, first and foremost, yeah, it's, it's, we cannot deny the fact that the spread of misinformation of fake news and the emergence of the era of post-truth is, really part of our of the society that we are living in today. And also with the pandemic that we had experienced in the past years, years, <laughs> it's been like almost two years already. And as well as with the climate change crisis, uh, the post-truth phenomenon is really part of it and how people deny the emergence or, 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 or the idea of climate change and as well as the spread of, of COVID-19. And even uh, there's this growing debate that is happening right now with regards to vaccine hesitancy and how uh, people think about the efficient, uh, yeah, the, the efficacy of the vaccines for COVID-19. Um, what I would like to highlight as the core idea or thought that I got from your discussion is that as we uh, counter or as we face the era of post-truth, it is necessary for, uh, for us, for the society, for the social science discipline in general, and particularly in public policy, to look into the meanings, how we interpret the facts that are being debunked by deniers and by, uh, by advocates of the post-truth. Uh, specifically, uh, what really catches my attention is your argument that when you talk about facts, uh, when we talk about facts and when we consider about uh, when we consider facts, it is very irrational for the present day or for the modern day society to dismiss the 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 need to acknowledge these facts because this these are empirical evidences. However, it is also critical and it's very necessary for us to understand way deeper the meanings that are being attached to the facts or yeah, the, the meanings, the social and political meanings that are attached to these facts or to these evidences that we have, uh, that, that, that we have in, in, this, in, various, in, in various crises or in various uh, public problems that we have in our society. Um, also, uh, uh, it's also critical to point out the idea of how truth is being framed and how this uh, group of deniers would counter argue the essence of truth or the, the, or the, the main, um, the, the, the relevance and the importance of truth. Uh, it's also interesting that you pointed out how the social status or the social class in the society uh, matters particularly on how we, on how, uh, on how the truth the truth is being surfaced in the post in, in the in the post truth discourse. Uh, basically, it's interesting to see and and to uh, 
it's interesting to to highlight that these climate deniers mainly discuss or mainly counter argue the climate change as a problem because of the underlying social social and economic uh, status of uh, that, that, that they are in, specifically on dismissing the, the thought or the idea that this climate change movement uh, is part and parcel of a way that it could be the left, that the left would like to impose the, the norm that the left would, would, would want the global, the, the society in the global scale would, would want us to do, or it is something that the, the global elite would like to impose in the, uh, in the in the society that we have um, that uh, in, the, in the global society or in the global context. It's somehow it's kind of form of the uh, of the domination of the global elites, and also the the argument on individualism, the individualistic in argument, the argument on how this uh, right wing conservative deniers would uh, surface the, con the concept of individual freedom as very inherent or uh, imperative to the, to the Western context. Um, maybe those are the few points that I would like to highlight from, from the things that I grasped from your, from your discussion and from the book. And I would, uh, I would really love to uh, read the book further uh, on, the, on this discourse and or on this debate. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, I, I think it's uh, kind of uh, a reflection of uh, what we learned from, from uh, your presentation today and also the, the book that you sent the copy to us as a kind of the New Year uh, gift. Okay, um, other participants here? Do you have any questions? Uh, Rodrigo, please. Um, Rodrigo, could you yeah. uh, turn on your camera, please? Okay, I try with my camera. Let me see. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Hi, Professor Fisher. Very nice to meet you again and see you again. Yes. Of course, nice to you. you. I have yeah. a question from the presentation. I haven't had the opportunity yet to read your book, but uh, I've been lately in deep on your uh, writings and on Hager, Hager writers, writings as well. And um, from your presentation mostly, I would like to First, to understand where is the line for a challenging discourse or challenging narrative to, in this case, climate change. And in order to be somebody who critique climate change or policy or the data or even the science and somebody who became a denier, where is this line? Because if not, if we don't have that gap, let's say, we are creating in a way an authoritarian thing, an authoritarian uh, science who said, yeah, what IPCC said is true and we all believe because it's a consensus and then at the end it became a regime of truth or not. That, that's my first question. Where is the, the, the line? Um, shall I address that one first? Yes, please. Uh, well, it's a... Uh, the critical question, uh, I think the bottom line is that we have to recognize um, that we have to take action and we have to then amass all of the evidence that we have against the social and political realities that we confront and decide what we think is the best course of action. This is exactly what we do in our everyday affairs when we confront a difficult decision. We weigh the factors. Now COVID is a better example because it's immediate. It's around us. I can open the door and it's outside, going past me maybe on the sidewalk, right? Climate change is down the road. So I don't have, to, not that much further anymore. You see all kinds of consequences, but I don't really have to um, uh, get 
totally worried about it today, but I can decide, um, have to decide how I want um, to deal with COVID. Um, we have increasing numbers, that's risky. Um, I don't want to get it. Uh, I have to take certain measures um, to, uh, to protect myself. And this requires a discussion. It involves how much risk I want to take. It involves uh, what I'm willing to do um, and um, uh, what the new factors are. For example, suddenly there's Omicron. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's a different kind of, of issue. To some degree, the question is a good one because it takes us to the forefront of society, of societal decision-making. Um, society, the government actually has to do this as well to decide what is the best possible uh, position at any one time for the society as a whole. Doing this, not knowing what's coming further. Will there be more mutants? Will there be new vaccines? We have to make a kind of best guess. And for the best guess, we need all of the evidence that we can have, plus our own uh, priorities. The priorities differ for different people. But of course, the COVID case is particularly perplexing because we have people marching around in the streets here in Germany, <coughs> um, claiming that the measures are fascist, that they're Nazi measures from the government to make you get a vaccination because it'll put strange things in your body, all this, this um, sort of thing. While now the hospitals are filled with people who are not vaccinated. It's very difficult, very confusing. It seems very irrational to the rest of us. So we have a society where, I speak of Germany at the moment, where 70 to 80% of the people share the dominant consensus that we have to get everybody vaccinated. But this 15 to 20% can make a huge amount of trouble. Um, but the, the answer to your question is, maybe it's not satisfactory, uh, because it's not firm, but it is it is involves a social consensus about what uh, we accept and what we don't um, accept. Excellent. Yes, and it does, and it actually give me the step for the next question. And this, I I agree on this. Like I believe that most of the social problem should be solved and might be at the end solved through this uh, social discussion and this social uh, <clears throat> debate and consensus at the end, right? That debate hopefully will bring a consensus. How can we get to a consensus when I, I, I do believe, maybe because of my naiveness or, or, or my not high knowledge, that consensus will be easily built when facts, data, and evidence are there. Now we see in politics and a lot in climate change, and it's part of my topic of the, of the thesis, this is where I've been dipping more, a lot of myth, political myth, right? And a lot of metaphors. And uh, we can see that from COP25, we pass from uh, overpopulation to now we are going to extinction. And those are not really that we have the data that tomorrow an asteroid will come and we will, but we put the metaphor of the dinosaur there. So that's a tremendous narrative towards a discourse of fear that now we are gonna extinct because we didn't understood that having a lot of baby was already a problem. Now we need to talk about it. So how do we get a consensus when first institutions are very down on credibility and legitimacy. Politics are very down because of their own corruption and working with the elites and etc. When all that exists, who 
at the end, who is more dangerous to get to that consensus? Those who deny and are critical to this, or actually institutions and politicians, those who should bring the debate and form uh, and drive to the consensus? Who do you think is more dangerous nowadays? Yeah, of course, as you said, um, the key issue here is trust. There's low trust. Um, this trust is manipulated by social media people who have an interest um, in exploiting social media uh, to um, create chaos. That's their only, we know there are people, who, it's their only purpose is to make other people afraid, uncertain, distrustful, and so forth, to make it impossible for this particular system to function. Some of them just seem to be doing that for its own sake. And this makes it extremely difficult. <laughs> People, this, there's a high degree of distrust uh, in the institutions who are the ones who are saying what the numbers are. They're telling us what the numbers are. And this is because of uh, past government um, failures. But even more immediately, um, here the debate is a kind of finger pointing debate because the government had said during the summer um, that there will be no additional lockdown. Now we talk about a lockdown in Germany. Um, so they say, you see, you can't trust these people. They said that and now they're doing this. But why are they doing this? If you're extremely right wing, they'll say because the pharmacy companies want to produce more vaccinations because it makes more profits and maybe Bill Gates will give them more money. Uh, this is a vicious um, kind of logic. What we have discovered, interestingly, now is that the government has set a date in which everybody has to be vaccinated or you can't do anything. That We have a backdoor lockdown here now. If you're not vaccinated, you can't go in the restaurant, you can't go in the theater and so forth. So this is why they're really marching around um, uh, because they're shut out. However, uh, however, they, uh, what we find is that in, since this has been said, increasing numbers of people have just gone and get the vaccine vaccination, whether they wait, just didn't want to get it, or they weren't sure, or whatever they said, I want, I don't want to be locked out, so I'll just get it. Everybody else gets it. So this actually, the strategy seems to be actually working for a segment of the society which weren't necessarily anti-vaxxers, anti-vaccination. <clears throat> it doesn't work for the heart, really hardcore, because that's not what it's really about for them. They're exploiting this for political purposes. What to do with them is very difficult to know, except to try to isolate them further and further and cut them off from this other segment of the society that just said, well, I'm not really sure, so I don't get it. <laughs> but now that I see the consequences, for me personally, I'm not getting it, meaning I can't go to the restaurant, um, that's... Uh, Difficult. A more difficult case that it's easy to understand um, is now the idea of vaccinating children. Well, a parent has to really think twice about this without being a crazy person, right? To give your, they don't know this much about it. And what could be the long term effects? Um, so uh, this is a extremely difficult. How to build back uh, the trust? I don't know exactly how to do that, but I think that a place to start is to speak more directly and more authentically to the people. We now have a new health minister um, who became a kind of celebrity because he was informing the public along the way, and he ended up on a lot of talk shows, um, a 
pro-vaccination, pro-action person, and he became the health minister. And, and people seem to be listening to him. They have a lot of, he, do, he produced as a human being, trust in himself. So when he says it, more and more people seem to believe it. Whereas when a typical politician says it in a talk show that he also, and you know that he's saying it because of his party, the position, then you say, well, uh, thank you very much, but I don't trust that guy, right? I want somebody who talks to me straight, tells me what is scary, what's risky, and what we will um, have to do, um, and that sort of thing. Um, I think a certain kind of deliberative fora, uh, like deliberative democracy, a deliberative policy analysis uh, can help, but this is more at the moment only accessible, uh, 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 not accessible, uh, usable in smaller kinds of groups. But it is possible for politicians um, and scientists. Scientists are also guilty. They don't understand that the numbers are not just the numbers. Uh, so when the, then when they change the numbers based on new evidence, people say, ah, you see, you see, I knew it, right? Uh, because they don't, we have to, also people have to learn uh, what science really is and how it really works to understand uh, the more subtle, sophisticated kind of discussion that has to take place. I've, I'm afraid to say is that what we learn in the course of these two years is that when we look at the society as a whole, um, we have discovered that we have a lot of people um, in the United States, in Germany, who aren't really very knowledgeable. They're not really able uh, to deal with these things. It comes as a kind of surprise because up to this point, we were sort of guiding along as this sort of um, modern society, uh, globalizing, everything positive, moving into the future, information society, knowledge society. And then we discover there are a lot of people that aren't connected to the knowledge society, right? Um, so that's a real gap that we left in our educational system. Schools are were really funded in the way um, uh, and, and, and developed in the way they should have been. Um, we, we, we ignored this, assuming, um, I don't know what we assumed, that these either weren't problems, they would take care of themselves, they're not so serious, whatever, uh, but that is a, a real issue. One of the things we actually discovered um, here is, <laughs> is that the children seem to be less irrational than some of their parents. In other words, we've discovered that the children aren't marching around. They have to wear the mask in the school, so they do it. They, if it means they could go to the school, they put the mask on. Um, I heard that on, on television last night from a, a politician. I thought that was a rather interesting observation, that the children, um, the children want the freedom. They want this freedom to go back to the school and they're willing to follow the rules. Uh, we don't really have a good answer to your question, which is the answer. We can talk about it, but we're searching for this in unprecedented time. We have no past history that will exactly um, tell us how to deal with this. We never had this so, such a global. Um, but you know what is my thoughts about it? It's like, and just to finish, because I think we're yeah. in time for the next time. Uh, I think, <clears throat> uh, how to say, people, it's not about denial or anti vax or anti climate change. I think those are excuses. And the problem is, as, as, as you just mentioned, it's trust. There is no trust. There is a lot of belief that I can do it better than they can do for me because 
at the end, as you say, one say they A, the next say they A plus B, and then it's, at the end we end up in F or in Omicron or whatever. So I think this trust is very difficult to rebuild, not impossible, but I, I also believe, and this is for much further, I think it has a lot to be with the epistemology of how people get in information today, social media, post through, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think yeah, I agree. Here. I agree. I think we have to be careful and say um, <clears throat> that there are people, anti-vaxxer people, who, who uh, from our point of view, are irrational, but um, they actually have uh, arguments that they can give. Um, and but some of them are okay. Like, for example, what we discover in Austria and in um, uh, Germany is that in the Alps, there are people living in the mountains hundreds of years, and they believe on natural remedies. Yep. They never, they never use these drugs or anything. They, have, they believe in anthroposophic views and so forth. And these are really deep, seated, traditional challenges to modern society, to modern science, to modern medicine. And um, they, they're a, a, it, it's difficult to say just that they're irrational, but at least for them, you know what you can talk about. Yeah, but it, in a way, it is irrational to conclude because they do have other vaccines on themselves. Many of them, they don't know Many it's in there. Many yeah, yes, yes. They don't ask who made it. They know that somebody earned money. They, they all know that. But now it's this vaccine, and it's more because of trust on the art. This what are they putting inside? Because who make it for the pro? I, I think it's a trust kind of yeah. thing that and, took and, over. And one last thing about trust is that it runs deeper than a particular politician or groups of politicians saying uh, the truth or speaking more authentically. For many of these people they would say it is the manipulative character of the capitalist system, in this case uh, reflected, say, in the pharmaceutical world, uh, that they have particular goals, and they do, they do, right? Uh, Pfizer is not willing just to give the patent to countries around the world. That's a fact, right? So you could say, well, what is that, right? They're not so humanistic, right? Yeah. So... Uh, it is is built into the operations of a, a Western, um, I don't want to say capitalistic system, but I can't find Developing. the word. Development, huh? system. Development system. Well, but that's, it is, then you don't, naming the driving force, <laughs> a form of capitalism. Um, so uh, that is here. And for example, in Germany, we have a large segment of people and they're uh, in the East who grew up under socialism and they believe that capitalism is doing these things. And they are a large percentage of the people who are unvaccinated. So when we need to have this social discussion, but it has to be really uh, deep going, thorough, deep into society and society doesn't seem to be ready for that. We're ready to talk to you about your particular argument about why this drug is safe or it's not safe. We have a lot of evidence. Nobody's, people aren't dying all over the world because they took it and so forth, but not about the mechanisms that lead, well, maybe even to the disease, if it has to do with the way we disturb the nature, human nature relationship because of, you said it, development, right? Uh, so there's a long chain of things, that, but but the, the existing regime, truth of regime, is not able to open that. Exactly. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate your questions. I, I hope to hope to be back uh, maybe in um, in March, and we can talk further. Okay, hey, the time is up. Uh, on behalf of the School of Public Policy, uh, Chiang Mai University, um, we would say uh, thanks for our good friend, Frank Fisher, uh, to join us today. We really 
pleased to have you with us and uh, we learn a lot from you I would say and a lot of people here need to go back to read your work to understand more especially the discussion based on the epistemological uh, foundation of different um, um, uh, philosophy I would say of metaphysics so uh, it's not easy to understand but yeah I, I think a lot of people are uh, inspired a uh, lot today. Thank you very much. Uh, we are going to have a very uh, short break for five minutes, and then uh, it's going to be the presentation of our PhD student, and Frank uh, will still uh, with us. Okay, so we have five minutes break. Thanks again, Frank Fisher. Uh, uh, please read. Uh, uh,